If you were alive in the year 2000, and old enough to remember what was going on back then, chances are you recall, at least a little bit, the out-of-nowhere popularity of a toy scooter called the Razor. The device itself was a relatively simple and, post hoc at least, seemingly obvious upgrade to an existing technology. A Swiss man named Wim Obiter, a former Swiss banker who quit because he claims the work was boring, and who has said that he had this revelatory moment in which he decided to build what became the Razor because he was lazy and wanted a sausage from a place located not that far away, but just far enough to be tedious to get there by walking. He invented the Razor, then, to help him cover these unfortunate in-between spaces, these micro-distances that are not far enough to justify the hassle of using a car or even a bike but a little bit too far to casually walk. When he was younger, Obiter's family would putter around on motorbike-style scooters. Think Vespas, the kind that you sit down on and can ride on roads. And they would also build their own little wooden scooters using a plank and a pole and some wheels attached to the bottom. As an adult, though, wanting to solve the problem of covering those weird in-between distances without having to worry about parking something the size of a bike or a Vespa or a plank with some wheels on it, he developed a plastic and aluminum scooter that was the right proportions for an adult to ride, that had additions to make it more comfortable, like soft grips on the handles, and importantly, one which could be folded up. So when you arrived at a bar to get a drink or at a restaurant to get a sausage, you didn't have this big cumbersome vehicle to deal with. The first Razor scooter, which was developed by Obiter's company, Micro Mobility Systems, but manufactured by JD Corporation, hit shelves in 2000 and was an instant hit. Millions of these things were sold primarily to kids, and although the marketing was targeted squarely at the 20-something and older market, the Razor was named Toy of the Year in 2001. Kids loved it, and that love reached a fever pitch when freestyle scootering became a thing, with riders, many of them veterans of skateboarding and bicycling, were sponsored by Razor to start doing stunts on their little foldable Razor scooters. In 2003, the first electric Razor scooter was released, and as of 2017, Razor had sold around 34 million scooters, 13 million of those electric scooters. Like all corporate origin stories, there is a decent chance that at least some of this I wanted a sausage so I invented a new vehicle storyline is either untrue or exaggerated. It's also thought, based on some contemporaneous reporting that was done back in 2001, that many of the important innovations that made the Razor novel and popular, making it out of aluminum, adding colored plastic and soft grips, figuring out how to make it fold just so, were actually the brainchild of a man named Gino Sai, the president of JD Corporation, when they bought the rights to manufacture the Razor from Micromobility Systems. Sai was a mechanical engineer and wanted to more efficiently navigate the factory floor where he worked, which led him to snap up the rights to produce the Razor and incentivized him to improve upon the existing blueprints. Whatever the truth may be, the Razor's dominance of toy markets for several years proved to be an important moment, not just for the world of toys, but for the concept of mobility, of city development and design, and potentially, at least, the future of urban and suburban transportation. Today, I would like to talk about motorized scooters, transportation on demand, and the economics of legally filling sidewalks with these toy-like vehicles. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent listener-supported show, and this is a different request that I don't usually make on here, but if you get the opportunity, if you've read a book that I have written, 
whatever that book might be, it would be super helpful if you would leave a quick review for that book up on Amazon. So if you get the chance, if you've read a book of mine and you've enjoyed it, please do take a moment to leave a quick review. It only takes a moment, but it can have outsized positive consequences for me and my work. All right, let's get back to the show. The piece I want to start with today actually comes from a newsletter rather than a typical online publication. The newsletter is called Oversharing, and it's a really wonderful weekly, I believe, missive about the sharing economy as a bundle of interconnected industries. I'll link to the specific issue of that newsletter that I'm discussing here in the show notes, but the newsletter as a whole is really worth checking out if you're interested in the industries in which companies like Uber, Airbnb, Grubhub, and so on exist. The piece in this newsletter that caught my attention was actually an assessment of another piece that was published in a periodical called The Information. And The Information is a fairly expensive online publication aimed primarily at investors and other high-end readers with a subscription cost to match that audience. So not having a subscription to that site myself, I was happy to see this outline explanation being published elsewhere. I may have to subscribe to the information one of these days as the work that they publish, the stuff that I catch a whiff of elsewhere at least, always seems to be pretty top-notch. But that original article on the information was called Inside Birds Scooter Economics. And it was valuable because first, it gave actual numbers straight from one of these newfangled scooter-on-demand companies, Investor Dex which is a slideshow that they give to those people and entities that they're trying to get money from. And second, because it underscored the fact that these scooter companies seem to be attempting to pull an Uber, where they just hemorrhage money for years while trying to achieve sufficient scale and dominance to put their competitors out of business and become an integral part of their customers' lives all while slowly raising prices and cutting costs to achieve some kind of positive margin. Most of their income, then, would rely on immense scale, and none of these companies is anywhere near the scale that they would need to stop bleeding money, much less to make any kind of profit. But before I get into those economic numbers, let's lay some informational groundwork. The type of scooter company that I'm talking about here in case you live someplace that has not, for whatever reason, been invaded by them quite yet, is the scooter-on-demand company that deposits little motorized foldable scooters around a city and then charges you to use them via an app on your phone. The average cost to use such a scooter is usually about $1 as a base fee just to unlock it, and then around 15 cents per minute after that. After you've unlocked the scooter using your app, you're then free to putter around using it to get wherever you want to go. And when you're done, you either return that scooter to another scooter station elsewhere in the city, or you leave it somewhere visible, usually along a sidewalk, so another rider can use it, or so someone affiliated with the scooter company can come by and collect it. More on that and how that works in a few minutes. As far as those of us outside the micro-distance transportation industry could tell, these things seemed to just pop up overnight. One day there were no scooters, the next day they were everywhere. Public spaces were super saturated with these things. Within the last year, large cities in the United States in particular have been flooded with them, and many of the larger companies with the biggest war chests seemed to have decided that the it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission model of interacting with local authorities was the right way to go. And in some cases, that actually seemed to have been the case, but in others, not so much. Bird, for instance, which is one of the three largest players in this space, and which was founded by a former executive of both Lyft and Uber, dropped hundreds of these little vehicles onto sidewalks around San Francisco, bypassing local authorities entirely. As a consequence, his company received a cease and desist order in June of 2018, telling them to, more or less, get their damn scooters out of the city, off the sidewalks and roads. A big part of the annoyance here was not just that those in charge at Bird didn't ask for permission before moving forward with this plan. 
but rather that their products, these locked scooters, which could be unlocked by paying with an app, were in the way, everywhere. The sidewalks were blocked by clusters of electric scooters, and it was becoming both an annoyance and at times a hazard. The attitude of Bird's leadership probably didn't help, though. Like the folks at the head of Uber and Airbnb and other sharing economy companies, these young punks with their lack of respect for the traditional way of doing things are also, at times, fairly pugnacious in their attitude toward laws and regulations. A city supervisor in San Francisco has been quoted calling the executives at Bird, quote, a bunch of spoiled brats, end quote. And city leaders elsewhere have said similar things, calling out these scooter entrepreneurs as being not just careless, but rudely and intentionally defiant, to the point of being disruptive of civil society. They seem to think that the laws that apply to everyone else do not apply to them. Now, the degree to which that opinion is merely a defense of the status quo is hard to parse, of course. I would suspect that at times these regulators are kind of just pissed off that their jobs, their laws, are being scoffed at and ignored by companies that can afford to absorb the fines that are levied as punishments. But just like not all rideshare companies are the same, there's a massive, outward-facing at least, difference in attitude between Lyft and Uber, not all of these scooter companies have been as regulatorily dodgy as Bird has been at times. And the ability to play well with others, especially local lawmakers and regulators, has definitely served some of these other companies quite well. San Francisco applied a blanket ban on scooters on their city streets for a good long while, after that deluge of illegal scooters that landed seemingly overnight. But some scooters were allowed to return to the city in October of 2018, with substantial caveats. First, the companies that passed muster were only allowed 625 scooters apiece for a six-month trial period, after which the city would reassess and figure out whether to increase that number, reduce it, or keep it the same. And second, the only two companies that would be allowed to operate in the city were lesser-known entrants called Scoot and Skip. None of the top three electric scooter companies, Bird, Spin, and Lime, would be allowed to operate in San Francisco. This decision was justified by explaining that not only did Scoot and Skip, despite being way smaller than their competitors, indicate that they would go above and beyond the terms and regulations set out by the city, but, and this is an implication that's pretty evident if you read between the lines, they were also companies that were not run by douchebags. And although that was said in a far more polite, legalistic way in the official paperwork, a lot of shade was thrown in the direction of those misbehaving scooter companies that crowded city sidewalks without permission just months previously. This was a punishment being levied and a reward being granted to the more measured, calm, respectful startups. Similar dramas are playing out in cities around the United States and around the world. This facet of the transportation industry is fleshing out quickly. And although the aforementioned Bird, Spin, and Lime are the three most well-financed and well-known contenders, at least at the moment by most estimates, Uber and Lyft are also involved in the scooter game in some cities, as is Ford through a company called Jelly. And there are a lot of other companies getting involved that, like Lime in particular, came from the world of on-demand bikes and other vehicles. Even Elon Musk has indicated that Tesla might get in on the game. This is a popular, trendy space with a lot of potential upside, at least theoretically. So all of these companies are scrambling to achieve a toehold in a space that is regulatorily different in every single city in which they're operating, and where there are various degrees of antagonism coming from both traditional transportation industry players and the officials who have been tasked with figuring out the pros and cons of having electric scooters in general, but also how many, in their districts. And on top of all of that, there are subtypes of on-demand electric scooter companies that make this process all the more complex. Some make use of docks, for instance, which means that when you rent a scooter to get you from point A to point B, the idea is that there will be docks along your route and wherever it is you're going. So you will snag a scooter from the dock filled with scooters near your apartment complex and then leave that same scooter at another dock near your office. Others, though, and Bird is included in this group 
which is part of what made their San Francisco adventure so annoying for so many residents and regulators, they make use of a dockless system, which means the scooters are just kind of standing there, scattered about, waiting for users wherever they were left by their previous rider. And you just snag one if you can find it. The app has a map that shows you where they're located, and you go on a little scooter hunt to find the one that you want. This method leaves the scooters without a natural charging mechanism for their electric motors, so Bird and a few other scooter companies of this kind often make use of a ragtag team of gig workers who sign up to drive around the city and pick up as many scooters as they can find and then bring them home to charge them themselves, to just plug them into the wall like they would their smartphone. In a lot of cases, as was reported in a really great article about this subsection of the gig economy in The Atlantic recently, which I will link to in the show notes, these gig jobs are fulfilled by teenagers who drive around picking up scooters and then go home, usually to their parents' home, to charge them. These gig chargers are then paid between 3 and $20 per scooter that they find and charge overnight. And when they are fully charged, they then leave them in designated areas called nests around their service area the next morning. So all of that context in mind, the economics of this space, of a scooter company, are fascinating. In part because, like with most tech-based startups, the venture capitalists are flooding these companies with money and in some ways incentivizing them to spend, spend, spend without necessarily making any profits for years a la Uber, as I mentioned before, but also in some ways mimicking Amazon's approach to things, but in a wildly different space. But it's also fascinating because there just seems to be a great deal of hype here. And it's not clear that the economics can be reworked in a manageable amount of time to make this a sustainable, long-lasting industry. Now, these numbers that were reported are from June of 2018, and a lot can happen in that amount of time, so keep that in mind. But I think they speak for themselves in terms of that suspicion that I have, one that is shared by many people who are a lot more knowledgeable about this space than I am, that this business model may not become sustainable fast enough to evolve into what scooter entrepreneurs want it to become, namely a fundamental profitable piece of urban and suburban infrastructure. In the first week of May 2018, Bird provided 170,000 rides to customers. 80,000 of those rides happened in LA alone, just in Los Angeles, and those rides took place across 10,500 active scooters. Scooters that they had out in the wild available for use. On average, each scooter was used five times per day. So that's already pretty interesting if, like me, you've ever wondered how many people actually use these things and how regularly. But here's where it goes from being interesting to, for the purposes of this conversation at least, being meaningful. Each scooter currently costs the company about $551, which includes the whole shebang, the scooter, an inbuilt GPS device, shipping, assembly, branding, and so on. An individual scooter generates an average of $3.65 in income per ride, and Bird spent $1.72 per ride in charging costs, another $0.51 cents per ride on repairs, on average, $0.41 cents per ride on credit card fees, $0.20 cents per ride on city permit fees, about $0.06 cents per ride on customer support costs, and around $0.05 cents per ride on insurance. Tally all of that up, and you get around $0.70 cents per ride, on average, coming back to Bird as profit. Which, I mean, is something, at least. They're not losing money on each ride, as tends to be the case for car-based ride-sharing companies in certain areas. But taking that number, $0.70 cents per ride, on average, and slamming it up against the cost per scooter and the amount of use that they typically get out of a scooter before it needs to be replaced sobers up the conversation pretty quickly. Yes, they make $0.70 cents per ride, but the scooters cost $551 apiece and generally only last around two months before they have to be replaced. So if you do the math and figure five rides a day, as they mentioned in that stat that they presented, which is about $3.50 profit per day per scooter, you find that it would take about 157 days or five and a quarter months to recoup the cost of a scooter. 
And again, these scooters are only expected to last due to the heavy use that comes with being out in public, exposed to the elements, and used on city streets and sidewalks all day. Only about two months on average. These numbers are all coming from a slideshow presented to investors back in June of 2018. And in that slideshow, they indicate that although scooters currently cost $551 a piece, they hope to get them down to $360 a piece at some point. That's like their dream goal, which is definitely better. But still, at their current per scooter income levels, that means that they would need 103 days or about three and a half months to recoup the cost of each vehicle before it's done for. And at the moment, they are only getting about two months worth out of each scooter. So unless they can both reduce the cost of their scooters and dramatically increase the amount of profit per unit somehow and manage to do so without the scooters dying more quickly as a consequence of that higher use, they are operating a company that cannot help but run itself into the ground over a long enough period of time. Which is not to say that they could not make this math work at some point. If they order more scooters at a higher scale, they could get Xiaomi, the Chinese company that currently makes their scooters, to drop the prices that they pay due to the economies of scale. Bigger orders typically mean lower prices. They could also benefit from background investments and evolutions in the product itself, which could conceivably lower the prices due to better systems and infrastructure, or a change in the materials that are used in the scooters. They could also find themselves receiving more rugged, longer-lasting vehicles for around the same price, as weak spots in the vehicle design are identified and fixed, which could also improve their outlook by increasing the amount of time that they can be used before they have to be replaced. They may also shop around, finding cheaper manufacturers willing to produce a nearly identical product for a substantially lower price. The exact same model that Bird is using is already available locally back in China for about $320 instead of over $550, indicating that there could be a way to shave off a huge chunk of that cost even through their current provider, but that same type of scooter could also potentially be either produced or shipped via another entity, saving them a great deal of money relatively quickly. One more point that I think is fairly interesting, even if it's not a huge issue in most cities quite yet, is that in some regions, scooter sharing companies have had trouble with vandalism, theft, and even robberies, with would-be thieves hoarding scooters in an alley somewhere and luring folks who want to use a scooter or the gig workers who are trying to pick up spent scooters to take home and charge into those alleys so that they can rob them in a place that they know is not under surveillance. Vandalism and theft of the scooters themselves is more common than robbery, though, and Bird had a lot of trouble when they first flooded the sidewalks of San Francisco, with locals picking up the scooters and throwing them into the San Francisco Bay in protest of the annoying vehicles cluttering the sidewalks. Other issues include clever tinkerers figuring out ways to remove the GPS devices from the scooters and then reselling them locally or on Craigslist, a few cities over, to avoid detection. And in some cases, neighborhood kids will drain the batteries on the scooters, rendering the GPS units and the digital locks inoperable, and then use the no longer electric scooters as toys, or as non-motorized kick scooter vehicles to get to and from school for free. A lot of these issues are just paper cuts compared to the larger issue of the on-demand scooter industry's economics, but those types of paper cuts can add up with time and with bulk. It'll be interesting to see how the model evolves to take these potentialities into account and how these companies can remedy them without becoming perceived as heavy-handed and vilifying themselves as corporate entities in the trade-off. One more point that I want to make about this nascent industry is the role it plays as part of a larger movement, specifically the effort to greenify and decarify cities while also ensuring that the solutions that are put into place are economically sustainable. I've spoken on past episodes about the shape and form of cities and how especially here in the United States, particularly in the western part of the country, the cities were built with the car in mind. The car was the atomic unit of the transportation infrastructure as it was imagined at the time. And that's obvious when you visit a place like LA or Phoenix. City designers clearly were not thinking about how to make these cities pleasant to walk around. 
were considering how to make the mass transit systems operate most efficiently. They were building for the car, which in the moment made a lot of sense, but now, today, kind of runs counter to a lot of the motivations behind the reworking of our cities. A great deal of our effort is invested in trying to make them more human scale rather than car scale and to invest in infrastructure that encourages people to walk around, to take care of their neighborhoods, to buy and do things locally rather than moving from point A to point B without noticing or caring what's in between. Many proposed and existing solutions to this issue can be found in the repurposing of existing infrastructure and systems, the revitalization of trains and buses, and even the move to make certain parts of town car-free, either all the time or a portion of each week. A load-bearing effort that's part of that larger movement, though, is almost always the increased focus on pedestrian and bike paths. In some cases, replacing four-lane roads with just two lanes, plus bike and pedestrian paths, sometimes called complete roads, because they do not prioritize cars at the expense of every other mode of transportation. You can visit certain cities around the U.S. and see efforts in this direction coming to fruition. Some of them flourishing, some of them not quite there, or perhaps valuable but not yet widely adopted by a confused or car-centric populace. The city bikes in New York, for instance, have become commonplace enough to have become memes. Some people use them regularly as part of their commute, while others use them situationally to get some place that they could walk or take the train to, but they can get there a little faster just by hopping on one of these bikes. On-demand scooters are meant to fill a currently unfilled niche within this larger changeover. Just like Vim Obiter supposedly envisioned with his Razor scooter, they are meant to bridge the gap between walking and and cycling, and it may be that they're able to do exactly that. One of those top three scooter companies, Lime, was actually formerly primarily a city bike competitor with on-demand bike hubs scattered throughout cities, but they have replaced some of those bike hubs with scooters and may do so with more of them in the future. The scooter, then, in some circumstances at least, would seem to be a better solution for the needs of users or a better business decision, or both and as a consequence could be more sustainable and potentially even more useful, at least in some situations. Now, the success of these companies is anything but guaranteed at the moment, and that's partially because of the aforementioned unfavorable business model, but also because they're just one component in a larger, sprawling effort to replace the World War II-era trend of every person owning a car and using that car to get everywhere as their core mode of transportation. Uber and Lyft and other ride-sharing companies are part of this burgeoning system, as are city bikes and local bus and subway systems and the tangled collection of walking and biking paths that many cities are investing more in as this space evolves in credibility and gains more public support. But any one of these other options could step in and drink the scooter industry's milkshake. These scooter companies could be a weird temporary blip on the radar, a bit like Razor was back in the day, experiencing a great deal of success all at once before fading into the background, replaced by the next shiny new whatever, the problem it seemed to solve decently well, newly solved by something else, and perhaps even more efficiently and effectively. It could be that scooters become economical and common enough that we all just buy our own, if they could be folded up small enough to fit in a backpack and could be purchased for under $100, I think a lot of people, especially students and folks who live in cities, could be convinced to invest in their own personal model, which would then bypass this on-demand economic effort. Especially if a company like Apple, or more likely in this space, at least in the near future, a company like Tesla, stepped in and made a sexier version than the one that can be had for a buck and 15 cents a minute on any street corner. It's easy to imagine an evolved, productized version of this service becoming a statement possession, sort of like our cars have become, for some of us at least, today. Whatever the future brings in this space, it's an interesting facet of the mobility industry to be watching, in part because of the economics, in part because of the vehicle itself and the technologies that it contains, and in part because it could point at what the next step looks like. How we get around the shape our cities take and whether or not we have any fun along the way.
If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider leaving a quick review up on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Doing so only takes a moment, but it helps other people find the show, which is very much appreciated, as does sharing the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it or sharing it with your social network of choice. Any and all efforts in this regard are very much appreciated. Thank you very much. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called All Systems Read by Martha Wells. And this is apparently the first book in a series, and I'm actually really looking forward to reading the next couple books. I think there's already at least one or two that are already out after this book and the series that are available. But the core premise here, and I'll just give the core premise, I don't want to give away too much more than that, is that the main character is a robot, essentially, like a security robot that was built and is owned by a corporation that then rents out these robots to colonizers and such who want to go out to other planets and who want to explore and do science. And this particular robot has managed to overcome the moderating software that ensures that she behaves, that she does what she is told, that she does what she is instructed, like a good security robot should. And as a consequence, she knows that she is just a trigger pull away from potentially going on a murder spree, but she really can't be bothered to do it. She's a little bit lazy and a little bit too involved with the soap operas that she recently discovered and all the other myriad entertainments available on this futuristic version of the internet to bother murdering all of the people that she has been tasked with protecting. Now, that's the main character. That is what is happening in the mind of the main character, and she is then tossed into a larger conspiracy and colonizing a new planet situation. But the premise itself, all by its lonesome, is pretty interesting. The writing is fun, and the protagonist, who calls herself Murderbot, is also a great deal of fun. So if you're looking for a piece of science fiction to read and don't want something super heavy, but want something that is kind of fun and interesting, All Systems Read by Martha Wells is an excellent option to check out. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can read my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. Feel free to reach out and say hello on social media. I am at Colin is my name pretty much everywhere. And if you'd like to come out and see me speak live, I am currently on tour around North America. You can find out more about that at becomingtour.com. Thank you so very much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.